person work and then evolution of other traits in the animal flower. And particularly the work that my students, uh, Melanie, Federico, Greg, Mani have been doing. Um, I'm managing the definition of the university and also the Australian research council. So what we have here is one approach to understanding adaptation, convergence, and divergence in a system where we can experimentally test the idea whether we can replay the table flat. We can do this at the trade level, either that the univariate or multivariate, we can do it at the genetic level, either at the level of the need, the locus, or the pathway as you just recently heard. And we can also ask whether the traits that are involved in parallel, uh, compromutation that arose from a standard genetic variation or from the mutation. We are actually interested in solving many of these questions, and then I'm going to tell you what we've been doing in the Senecio complex with respect to the molecular basis of adaptation. Senecio Lotus is a very diverse complex that occurs along uh, the coast of Australia, the Alpine region of Australia, and many other uh, environments, and then we're going to focus on the coastal areas. So this is the sand dunes where this particular ecotype occurs, it's tall, branched, not so resistant to stress, whereas we have the headland type that is short or prostrate and lives on rocky headlands exposed to strong winds, salt, and high levels of stress. These ecotypes, the two of them occur in Parapatri, along the coast, there are many pairs of them, many of them are separated by a few meters, despite the contrasting uh, soils that they occupy, and others about a, a few hundred meters. They share pollinators, and their seeds are like dandelions. They do disperse long distances. One of the interesting things of the system is that ecotypes, like in the previous alpine example, we have them um, grouping by geography and not by um, ecology. And if you want to take a look at how we think about how to distinguish uh, this topology effect via secondary uh, contact versus primary contact, I urge you to go and see Jeff Gross poster 153 tonight. We have evidence that there's multiple origins, and we know that even though we can look at the genetic level, whether there are similar differences or different uh, nucleotide differences between genes, what we know is that for the most part, there's very little the similarity amongst those pairs at the genetic level, except when we think about the function, the predictive function of those genes. Right? And we use this just to create a hypothesis. So we have one particular enriched function in our genome scans that has to do with the movement of auxin along different cells. And auxin is a very important plant hormone that is with growth and differentiation in the plant. And the, why, the reason why we think this is interesting is because when Darwin was interested in this by noting that when you have a particular plant exposed to a source of light from the sky, they actually bend towards it. And that's what we call tropisms. So these tropisms arise because auxin, that hormone that we're talking about, actually moves from one side of the tissue, let's say the stem, it moves to the other side of the stem, and then when it's present in high concentration, cell division starts, or the cells elongate. And then physically, the plant bends. So we have the hypothesis that, basically, based on the population genetics data, that the headland and the dunicotypes have diverse tropism. But how do we test that? So we have actually flipped the approach. Instead of actually looking at the genes that might be controlling this one, we're going to say, well, if we know that <coughs> divergence in tropism might be involved, what do mutants in our adults look like, for example? How have they been surveyed? What are the phenotypes that they actually have looked at? And then we can actually make predictions about novel phenotypes that should be divergent between these two types. So the obvious phenotype that my plant developmental geneticist a colleague told me I should look into is rapid tropism. So this plant was turned to the side and then it just bends in the direction of the vector of gravity, but we call this negative tropism. And this one occurs in the absence of light. So you can separate the tropism due to light versus the tropism due to these pressures. In the system that we have, you can see here we are able to measure that type of tropism. There's a gravity tropic plant. This is an a gravitropic plant, and you can see it here next to one another. So we can actually estimate those angles. So the hypothesis is that if there's divergence in these pathways that control oxygen 
movement, then we should see also parallel evolution of this trait. And this trait should predict the height of the plant. So what we do is look at multiple populations at different heights, a tall plant population, short plant population. We have many of those pairs, including those that are currently at fine region. We have a couple of exceptions that often occupy very similar environments. We occupy very contrasting environments. So as I said, we expect a very strong correlation between uh, gravity tropism and height. When we look at a genetically corrected analysis for the correlation between the two, what we see is that plants that respond very well to gravity and to be taller in the two plates that we find in the system. So this is yet a strong correlation between the two. So we can perhaps keep exploring this trait on its own, which I mean we can high throughput this phenotyping, we can understand the molecular basis much more so than height of a complex trait, and we can start narrow down the set of genes that might be explaining the variation in these phenotypes. So even though the parallel evolution of this trait also suggests that um, natural selection might be involved, we want to actually get at a direct estimate of selection acting on this trait. So what we do is actually selection experiments in the field in which we create what we call a blend, an eighty generation of random mechanical contribution from 60 parents at the top, from the dune and the headland, we let them flow into a replicate, and then once we have this blend population, we put them in the field, and we just track them over the several generations, and we do truncation selection of the survivors, we get the top 50. And then at the end, at the F10 generation, we say, okay, the ones that have survived in the headland, the ones that have survived in the dunes, how does, and this is only viability selection, how do their phenotypes look like? So what we want to know is whether we have evolution of gravitropism or agravitropism in the two particular environments. So to know that we're actually experiencing selection in the field in the expected direction, we can show that over a year, to a trunk experiment per year, the divergent selection the strength varies, but it's always in the same direction. So during the period of the experiment, we know that the headland and the two population were pulled apart in the same way, to different degrees. Now, this is what we see with respect to whether gravity can respond to selection. On the x-axis, we have the thickness of the family in the field, right? So we have some families here that have a lot of offspring, that a lot of offspring in the field across all the plots that we have. Another family is here that has very few, okay? Now, here we have the phenotype of the offspring that we mentioned in the glass house. So these ones were crossed, these ones were crossed, they left offspring, we measured the gravity in the glass house. So these plants in the sand dune, this is going to be the sand dune panel, these are high thickness families, should be highly gravitropic, and these other families here should be non gravitropic. And that's exactly what we see. So over short periods of time, under very strong selection, we can actually make the population uh, respond to selection in the, in the expected direction of the local type, as you can be reminded here. And on the headland, we lost most heritability, there's little variance items for this trait after the ransom selection. Yet most of the uh, families have as moderately agravitropic uh, pathway genes, and we find those. And this is one of the most interesting ones that we find, it's called the gene, and it's in a strong linkage to this equilibrium with ABA3, a uh, gene that also controls another hormone called abscisic acid. Abscisic acid <laughs> is related to, which you can see here, related to stress responses in the plant and oxygen transfer to growth and differentiation. These two genes are in a strong linkage distribution only in the survival populations. In the control populations, they are not in linkage distribution. Yet another signal that perhaps these two might be actually, or the regions where they are contained, are responding together with respect to selection. Now, these genes are interesting because the enolol gene is a vacuolar uh, transporter of oxygen. So this is the parenchyma on the outside of uh, on the stem. This is the back of this white area here. And um, in order to support in that sits on that membrane. Right? And ABA3 is a, a protein that modulates another protein that gives uh, the level of abscisic acid that will be produced. And abscisic acid runs literally through this parenchyma. And depending on the stress of the plant, you have more or less abscisic acid. So to some extent, we have. Um, nice projection that we are trying to be able to explore with respect to the physiological basis of this particular type of evolution in this system. Now, in order was not discovered because of oxygen. 
was actually discovered because mutants of the nodal have problems with point to reception. The discovery about oxygen came later, right? So, I mean, it's one of those things that say, well, I mean, like, if this region or genes like this are truly involved in this one, we can also make a, sim a simple prediction, and is that genes that take here you have a 5% failure, but between them, we have a 21%. I told you that in a system where we have uh, independent and repeated evolution of multiple nucleotides, we can actually look at the genetic and molecular ecological basis of these traits by using conventional and non-conventional approaches that might reveal ultimately the connection between these two processes of adaptation and speciation. And with that, I thank you very much. And I'm happy Thank you very much.